The More of Us podcast features real, uncut conversations about life, pastoral ministry, and walking with Jesus. All guests are pastors in the Karis Fellowship, bound by our common commitment to biblical truth, relationship, and mission. We trust as you hear more of us, you'll see Christ among us. We are here with the More of Us podcast. I am Pastor Tim Sprankle, and I'm here with Dr. Trent Lambert. We are in a cozy studio on a beautiful day in Winona Lake, Indiana, stuck inside. I um, walked across campus just a few moments ago, Tim. The sun is shining, and there's actually some boats on Winona. So, Tim, we we, we got to figure out a better place to do this podcast. We got to get on the Lancer boat or something. That'd be an idea. Podcast on the Lancer boat. I like that. I don't know how we get rid of the wind sounds, but that would be awesome. Also, uh, we are here in studio. Well, he's not live with us. He's on the phone, but we have Nick Cleveland all the way from Worcester, Ohio, joining us. Nick, thanks for being part of our podcast conversation today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So Nick and I serve on the Fellowship Council together, and I've really enjoyed getting to know Nick better one of the stories I will share is that after a fellowship council meeting, I was rushing off to a care symposium presentation, and I was carrying stacks of paper and some snacks for the people, and I was probably a little bit harried because I was also thinking about how I was going to present this paper on my body in myself. I forget what the exact title was, but Nick saw me wrestling with all these things, and he, he runs up to me, walks up to me and says, hey, can, can I help you with that? He starts distributing snacks and papers, and I'm like, this is like a pastor of a big church. He's on the fellowship council and he's opening doors and distributing papers and snacks for people. And I loved it. I don't know if you remember that, Nick, but it meant a lot to me. So uh, thanks for being part of our conversation and being a servant leader. Oh, wow. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure and it's a part of being a part of the kingdom of God. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself since we don't have a bio for you because you are hidden online. Um, Tell us Tell us five words that describe you. Yeah, boy, that's a good question. Uh, I started asking other people, uh, and they said uh, goofy, antagonistic, big picture, Jesus loving, and influencer. Those are the words that people said about me. Those are great. I like that you used two compound words, so you really actually crammed seven words in there. Seven. Wait, yeah, that's what? how pastor works. <laughs> <It's> how... <laughs> If you could have made them alliterate, we would have been really impressed. But uh, that would be my predecessor, Bob Federhoff. He's the king of that. So, okay, very good. <laughs> now, this next question, please um, think carefully and process. If you could only pick one Ohio sports team, college or pro, to root for, who would it be? Yeah, you don't have to think very hard there. Uh, that's the Buckeyes. All right. Yes, Trent and I, uh, we try to get every other guest as a Buckeyes fan. I'm, yeah, well, I'm, I mean, it, it unites the whole state, so it's it's easy. And the Browns and the Bengals, I mean, they've been so bad historically that it's not even close. I graduated from the, and so I am opti- optimistic that our the year this year is going to be a little bit better. I, I've got a good feeling, Nick. I got a good feeling. Yeah. Uh, they've got a loaded roster, and it's time to turn it around, isn't it? It is. Did you see that they did a ranking of of spring games and stadiums, and the yeah. OSU shoe ranked number one with over 80,000 fans? That's, that's insane. That That's spring incredible. Spring football, yeah. That is a wild number. I'm a fan, too. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, originally, so you can't get that out of your blood. But Trent and I are here in Indiana watching lots of Notre Dame fans and others. So that's what we have to suffer. That's Yeah. Yeah, I apologize to our listeners, but when they say the word Hoosier, it just doesn't have the same ring. <laughs> no, no. And the Notre Dame fans, I mean, like, it's important to point out, it's 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 closing in on a century since they beat us in football, so... I appreciate you, time. Nick. I appreciate you saying that. In fact, we could just close this podcast right now and be done. <laughs> but I will say we do have other matters to talk about. Now, you gave us two words. You gave us goofy and antagonistic. I've I've picked up that you've got a good sense of humor. You've made me laugh before. I've seen that. But when was the last time your sense of humor got you in trouble? Uh, last time today. 
or just <laughs> <laughs> is it is Good it job. a pretty regular occurrence is it like a daily oops i said that yeah the snark can get you in trouble i have like yeah. a little <laughs> yeah i have a little banter uh with the church like i really don't like cats it's an issue from childhood and uh i let people know like you can like your cat but you know cat lovers are delusional enough to think that everybody will like their cat and i'm just reminding there to remind them that's not ever going to happen so i get in trouble with that i've had a couple people ask me to stop so and, and i take a break for a little while now i do have to give a pause here for all of our listeners we are an equal opportunity animal lover so we're not hating cats on the program <laughs> yeah. see right there my humor just got us all in trouble well, Craig Rochelle brings up cats a lot of times too. He's he uh, oh. when I hear him preaching or talking, that it's easy to make fun of cats. So, yeah, there you go. Hey, we've been talking about humor, and we've already had some some snark. I like that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> um, how does your family have fun together? Yeah, uh, our family enjoys being together and playing games. Uh, our oldest is uh, 17 and he's very much into like uh, strategy games. And so we'll play those. Uh, we, we can be caught any night of the week out in the front when it's nice out playing pickleball in the driveway. Uh, uh, and so we like to do that and we like to hike and walk together a little bit and, uh, yeah, we like to do that. Can you actually give us the, like your family, you mentioned that you have a 17 year old and who else is in your family? Yeah. Uh, I'm married to my wife, Vicki. We've been married for 20 years. Uh, plus years here. This will be 22 this summer. I was going to say, could you identify the plus? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. July 21st is the anniversary, and so I'm excited uh, to celebrate that with her. And then we have three wonderful children, Aiden, who is 17, a junior in high school. And uh, I just uh, finished watching him play at a tennis match uh, tournament here. And then uh, we have a son, Isaac, who's 15, and uh, he is into basketball, super into basketball. And then we have a daughter named Hadley, and she is going to be 11 in a couple of days, and she's into tennis as well. So we play a lot of pickleball in tennis because of that. Does, does tennis affect pickleball or vice versa? Uh, I think real authentic tennis lovers can't stand pickleball, but they're going to find out that's what it's going to turn into for them, you know, the older that they get. So When they slow um, down and they realize, like, yeah. playing half the court is so much better for my legs right. and lungs. right. It's funny, uh, Aiden and his uh, partner, their net game is totally drawn from kids playing pickleball. Hmm. It's just a different kind of net game. You can see it. So, Yeah, pickleball has been wild how popular it's become. Is it, your driveway must be flat then. Yeah, it's it's like perfect size for it. So we have a net we pull out the whole nine yards. Tim, do you play pick, tickle, pickleball? I do, but I am afraid that one of these days my Achilles is going to go snap. And when we were at our fellowship council meetings, that actually happened to one of our fellowship council members. Playing pickleball? Playing pickleball, yeah, it's tragic. Well, I don't think I'm going to play pickleball then. I mean, you don't have to move that much, but I'm a competitive person, so if I'm going to play something, I'm going to, like, give it my all. You're going to put the stress on your Achilles then? Yeah. Okay. It's going to happen. Uh, I know you're not on Facebook all that much, neither am I, but every once in a while I see you popping up there, which means you know how to waste a little bit of time. What what would be some other time wasters for you, Nick? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I, I work very hard uh, with our family and my assistant to make sure that my schedule's pretty free from those. But, you know, I think all of us can end up in meetings or conversations uh, that we don't or shouldn't be in, um, whether that's scope of leadership or responsibility or just overall time waster. So I think conversations and meetings that I don't need to be a part of. So he's actually having this conversation with us right now. So we made the cut. <laughs> Did you catch that, Trent? Sh sh should we pause this or put some encryption on this? <laughs> This is a special moment. Was it that, or did I accidentally ruin my day? <laughs> I don't know yet. We'll get a note from your assistant. Like, you, you would never call him back. Hey, Nick, um, you, you've mentioned, and, and um, Tim said it as well, that you're the lead pastor at Worcester Grace. Um, we all have a starting place somewhere. Um, it's not your first minister position. Can you walk us through your, your pastoral ministry journey and unpack that for our listeners? Yeah. Um, I grew up in Fremont, Ohio, and I was part of the Grace Brethren Church, now Grace Community Church there. And um, my youth pastor at the time, Kevin Pinkerton, who's now the senior pastor there, 
uh, it was and still is a great mentor in my life. And uh, I served on staff there as an intern and a resident and then an interim youth pastor. Uh, before I went away to school, I went to Liberty uh, in Virginia after I started at Bowling Green State University for a couple of years. And then while I was at Liberty, um, I was trying to get just as much ministry experience as I could and uh, saw a posting on the fellowship website for a senior pastor for Garden City Grace Brethren Church in Roanoke, Virginia. And uh, I reached out to him. I said, well, you sure don't want me to be your pastor, um, but I would love to preach. And if you need somebody, let me know. And so they hired me for a month to come over and preach, and then they offered me the job. And so I was a solo pastor at Garden City for um, about 18 months. Uh, my wife and I, they knew that we were going to leave the area probably um, once she finished school, uh, and we wanted to go back into youth ministry. And so while we were there, the opening came here in Worcester um, uh, to be a high school director under Pastor Bob Fetterhoff, and we moved in December of uh, 2002 up to Worcester, and we've been the high school director, uh, the youth pastor, the next-gen pastor, teaching pastor, and then went through succession a few years ago to become senior pastor. So that's my journey. I'm curious if you might even walk us through some of those stages. People often say, like, you don't want to view a ministry position as just a stepping stone. So when you're doing youth director, you're not thinking, I'm I'm taking Bob's place eventually. Um, you're in it. You're wanting to learn lessons. You're wanting to be effective. So as you reflect on some of those different roles, what are some different lessons God taught you? And you don't have to go through every one, but a couple of those were like key learning moments at different roles or positions you had. Yeah, I mean, you always learn at your first job, right? You learn uh, different uh, skills and whatnot and um, things that you your weaknesses maybe get exposed to for the first time. But I think Garden City Grace for the Church, I actually kind of uh, jokingly say I went to Liberty University and I went to Garden City Grace Brother Church for seminary um, because they taught me as much as I could have ever taught them, like good and bad. Um, we had quite a ride there. It was tumultuous, but uh, God used it in my life. Um, and then when I moved here uh, to Worcester, and I'm going to compare these together for my lessons, um, pretty soon after I moved here, my mom... Uh, was diagnosed with cancer and passed away in a three-week battle with cancer. Wow. And so I think I got into ministry because I sensed something in my heart, but I think I loved ministry. And through Garden City in the early time here in Worcester and the mentorship of Pastor Dave Lawson and Pastor Bob Federhoff and their coaching and Pastor Kevin in my life, I think God broke my heart for people and people who are far from God, and that uh, the gospel changes everything because Jesus is alive. And so he kind of shaped my heart for a love for ministry to a love for Jesus and people. Mm. And uh, so in that came a ton of humility. Some of it came through humiliation, which was good for me. I needed to be humbled. Um, but I like to think that I'm a recovering prideaholic every day. Hmm. And so much of that has been things I've learned in the process of those ministry places from great people uh, along the journey. Uh, just to get a little bit more specific, could you even walk through one of those things that was like a humbling lesson for you? Because there might be people listening who are thinking they're at a different point in their ministry, maybe early on, and, and they have that love for ministry that needs to be sort of broken and turned into a love for people. And, and sometimes God uses humiliation or, or humbling moments for that. Could, could you give us a little bit more detail on one of those stories? Yeah, I think uh, when I was ready to, I came to Worcester licensed. I was licensed in the Northwest Ohio district and uh, I was ready to be ordained. And I probably would have checked all the boxes in theory um, that you would have expect you know, theological competency, pastoral ministry, some fruit in the, in the ministry and whatnot. A number of years have passed. And Dave Lawson looked me in the eye. We've talked about this many times, so I'm not telling him anything he doesn't know. And he looked me in the eye and he goes, you've checked the boxes, but you're so prideful. Hmm. And I, one of my mom's last wishes was to be at my ordination. And she had passed. And hmm. I was functioning through hurt and fear rather than being led by love and security. And scripture says perfect, you know, love drives out all fear. And uh, I needed to take a step back and allow God to do a work in me 
before I could be credentialed to do a work through me. Mm. And uh, that was ha- humiliating because it was an obvious next step and it was obvious to everybody. But it wasn't time. And I had to wait a year. And I went through a process of just meeting and being mentored and coached and learning to uh, ask questions first and stay curious um, to not assume that I have the best opinion on anything ever hmm. um, and to surround myself with great people who see it differently sometimes. And even if I think in my mind, I know where I want something to go, take the time to listen and lean in because you might be surprised what the spirit can teach you through other people. That's great. That's really helpful. I, I think of that uh, passage in Second Timothy two twenty two, where it says, flee youthful lusts. And he's talking to, a to a younger man. And a lot of times, especially when I was younger, I thought like, don't look at porn. And the more I study that passage, the more I think he's saying to Timothy, one of the lusts of youth is always being right and being viewed by mm. everybody as the smartest person in the room. Because if you go on and read the rest of that passage, it says, know how to have tough conversations and be a good listener and a gentle rebuker. And it sounds like those men in your life were were tough with you, but gentle. And that's one of the things God used to help you become more humble. Yeah. You know, that's exactly right. And that's a great passage for it too. Uh, for that passage jumps at me. It's exactly what I learned. It's, it's about the lust for power. Mm-hmm. And the lust to be right and to try to prove something uh, that your heavenly father doesn't need you to prove. Mm. Nick, let's take that concept, what you just said, and let's um, transition now to staffing. Um, you you <laughs> have a sizable staff. And so we, we've kind of heard a little bit about your spiritual formation and development. Um, give us a, a look of what your ministry team looks like and how do you encourage and empower them? I'm really glad you asked this question because I think it goes perfectly off the heels of, of the last one, at least in my mind, because it looks very different how than how it would have looked had the Lord not worked in my heart and I not responded to his grace and to go in the process of learning to be more humble. Um, <clears throat> I would easily gravitate towards more dictation kind of leadership. Here it is. This is what we should do. Go, 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 go. Um, and I've learned to be patient and to surround myself with the great team. So we have a senior leadership team of five and, uh, they're incredible people. They fit the matrix of, um, fast paced people, slow paced, uh, leaders, uh, task oriented leaders and people oriented leaders. And so we don't always see clearly eye to eye on everything, which is exactly what I need in that room. And so uh, they they do the work of the ministry. They're leading the teams that lead the teams that lead the teams. And uh, my goal is to encourage them, empower them, uh, to release them to do ministry. Uh, and so we do a lot of collaborative work on the vision and the direction, and then they run the ministry. We have a staff of about uh, 25 to 30, a uh, full-time equivalent here. And uh, so it is a rather you know, big staff in general. Um, but, uh, God has gifted us with some incredible talent and gift and wonderful hearted people who love the Lord and, uh, excel at what they do from production and worship to, uh, groups. And, uh, you know, we're a little outside the box in a few positions. Uh, you know, we have, a an adjunct groups director who lives in Spokane, Washington. Uh, one of our teaching pastors runs another ministry in town. Uh, so we do things a little different like that, but the overall leadership is collaborative. Uh, and my goal is to set them up to lead well so that if I'm step out of the scene, maybe no one would really ever miss me. I mean, I hope they will. <laughs> I I had mentioned to you that um, during COVID, your church was, was pointed out as one that was really doing great with uh, online worship. And when I mentioned that to you, your immediate response was, that is because our team did an incredible job of setting it up. I just stood on the stage, but they made it happen. And I can hear yeah. you saying similar things in your answer to Trent's question there. Yeah, we went uh, we went to video venue back in 2015. So we were using video before COVID. It was a muscle we knew about, a little bit about, and how to use. And uh, But even last week, um, we switched something up with the way I preached the sermon 
And, you know, the, I, I worked with our video producer, Kimberly, the whole week on how we were going to do it and where I had to stand and where the cameras are going to be. And she just made it so simple and easy. Uh, that's a real gift in the church today because we're I'm speaking in one room and it's being broadcast into another room on our campus and then to another campus, not in our location. So it's a unique setup. So we have to have that kind of team. Nick, one of the things we're doing here at Grace College and Seminary is we are trying to be innovative, and um, uh, we, we've de developed um, a concentration at a master's level that incorporates ministry tech, and we are also designing, and it has been approved and it will be rolling out this fall, is a doctorate of ministry with a concentration in hybrid church, which encompasses a lot of different modalities. Um, could you address and just kind of talk to us? This is kind of off, off yeah. course here, but how important is technology um, for your ministry right now? Yeah, it's very important. Um, from social media, which is kind of, we view social media as a little bit of a PR statement about your church. You're kind of, people can kind of get a general feel. Um, our services that are online, we actually do them for the people of Grace Church knowing that the community will watch. Uh, we we typically hear people who visit our church that they're watching online weeks or months before they ever step in the door. Uh, so you got it's almost like your sign that you used to put on the road. Now it's your your online footprint and presence is the image that people have of your ministry before they even set foot in the church. And the cool part about it is, right, you can actually invite them in. They can get a peek of what it's like inside uh, and a service. And so we use it for social media presence. Our services are online all the way through next steps. We use the text in church response every week here. Mm -hmm. Um, I, on Easter, you know, we used it and we had quite a good response and we use it for follow up and, uh, signing up for classes and registration for things, things like that. And so all of that goes into technology in the church and it's, it's integral. It's, it's very much integrated into our ministry. Uh, we don't necessarily track our online attendance. I don't think anybody actually knows how to do that. Um, so we just kind of say, hey, we had this many devices viewing it. We never did during COVID. We just counted it completely separate. We're like, I don't know how to do that. So, um, you know, there was some very creative math going on out there in church world for that. But um, so we counted it separate, but we kept track of it because we were curious what was going to happen to it. And we still do today as much as we can. You mentioned next steps. Um, so next steps, I presume, is is kind of like, um, you know, acclimating people to your ministry. Well, what does that look like strategic, strategically as as people come and visit and then you take them to the next level? Yeah, um, we, we do have a church where, you know, we're growing, we're seeing new families and new people all the time into our church. Um, we do a series of three classes on Sundays after the services. Uh, called Starting Point, which is our kind of like welcome to grace, learn a little bit about the mission, the values, and the vision, and the doctrine of our church. And then we do Start Serving, because we found that people want to get plugged in, they want to serve right away the following Sunday. Uh, and then we'll do what's called Jump Start the third Sunday. Um, you can attend one, you can attend two, you can attend all three, it's up to you. Jump Start is focused on what we are calling the prudent practices, their spiritual disciplines. Um, of the faith. Uh, and so it's kind of a place to go, hey, my faith is stuck or I need some help here. And it gives you practical ways and tools to engage one of the spiritual disciplines and some follow-up from pastoral support in that. So that's how we get people into the church. Those proven practices are also our next steps as a church from you know salvation, baptism, get in a group, start serving, pray, read your Bible, live on mission. All of those are a part of those proven practices. So we, we focus on those all the time. We do those classes uh, once a quarter, roughly, and uh, we've seen a ton of fruit from them. Uh, I think we just did Jump Start last weekend, and I think we had 30 or 40 people participate in that particular class. So it was good. That's great. Yeah, all this stuff is laid out on your website pretty clearly, too. And as I was looking through that, it's very easy to follow along with ways for people to get That's good, because I have no idea how we do that. <laughs> we have a great team that does that. Sure. I, I overheard you say at our fellowship council meetings that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you still spend 20 hours a week on a sermon. Maybe it was that week. Maybe that's on average. So what t break that down. What is sermon prep like for you? How often are you preaching a year? And then the 20 hours, break that down. 
this is exciting for me. I was just, I just had an incredible opportunity to sit next to one of the senior pastor, a senior pastor of one of the largest churches in America recently. And we kind of geeked out for about a half an hour together on sermon prep. And mm-hmm. so uh, I, I got some things I'm going to be tweaking in this, but overall I do, I spent about 20 hours. Um, we write together as a team, the teaching team, and maybe a few other pastors, we write what's called a graph about every sermon in each series. And that's done about 10 weeks ahead of time. And that will be a general idea and a clear text that we're using for a sermon. And it'll have like an intro thought, a whole essence of what we're trying to say, and then a clear next step. And we do that 10 weeks out for every sermon so that our team can start preparing. Um, So then the week before I preach a sermon, I will pull out the graph and I will do more text study and I will study the text this week that I'm preaching next week. Okay. And so I detail outline that on my whiteboard and I snap a picture of it and send it to the team by the end of the week. Um, Then I wake up on Tuesday morning at 445. That's my first day of the week. And I go to my little office, makeshift office in the basement and I start writing. So I now have the work that we did to write the graphs. I have some creative elements that the team met and talked about. And I have my detailed outline that I did last week and I transcript typing word for word, um, you know, the message. And so usually it's done around nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. So when the team comes in there, most of them, their first day of the week is Tuesday. Uh, they get the transcript right away and they have a clear direction of where we're going. Then people give me feedback on that. Uh, throughout the day and then on Wednesday morning I edit from that feedback different ways of saying things in slides and whatnot and then I let it sit and that that editing process can take one to three hours depending upon what it is and then on Friday I actually get the transcript out and then I rewrite the transcript by hand Hmm. as a part of the internalization process and what I've noticed in that part of the process that helps my delivery a ton. I I cut stuff there that I didn't usually, or I didn't cut before I did this practice. Um, I start cutting more because I'm getting to the essence of what the text is trying to say and what I'm trying to say and get people, you know, to think about or how to respond to that. And so then I, I just recently in the last two or three months started doing this and now I'm going up with like no notes. Okay. So after all of those different stages, and especially the handwriting process, letting it stew a little bit, it's it's in you. So that when it Sunday morning me. comes, it it's just flowing out of you by the power of the Spirit. And how many times do you preach on a Sunday morning? How many services? Yeah, I preach three right now. Uh, we only have about a 15-minute window in between them. So usually I'll, at the 8.30 service, I'll you know, jump off the stage and I have a couple people. I'm like, okay, you know, what feedback do you have? Uh, cause I'm looking for very specific things, you know, cause there's not a lot of time to change them. And then I, you know, go in to do the other two. The first hour is usually it's what we try to capture that, um, because we have a venue in our building and then a campus outside of our building that can use that if it works, if I didn't make enough mistakes, um, I made too many mistakes and we got, then we got to go live on a, uh, time slip we call it, um, at the 945. But at 945, I can be speaking to the room I'm in, another room, and the campus, and the online church all at the same time simultaneously. And then 11 o'clock is my favorite service because I can just get up there and really don't care. (laughs) It's funny because I've had uh, a couple other guys I know who do three sermons on a Sunday morning. They say the second one is usually their best one. And by the third one, they're they're the most relaxed. Uh, Yep. Because, you know, anyway. I think the third one's the longest one too, because you start like, oh, I should have said that. Oh, wait, I still can. Well, I only preach once a week, so it's always the longest one. And uh, <laughs> that's not a measure of effectiveness, by the way. Like the longer I go, uh-huh. the, the less I cut. Um, how are you determining on that backside of a sermon what, what made it effective? So what are some of the yeah, feedback boy. pieces you're looking for and life change you're looking for? I think if a person can understand that what I said and how what I said came from the text, that's a win because you're teaching them how to study the Bible too, right? Mm -hmm. As you're teaching. And if people are taking next steps and you're hearing fruit, like, hey, that really, the spirit used that to speak to me and I I need to address this. 
Um, sometimes we can base that on the number of people that respond to a particular thing, uh, but oftentimes it's fruit that's down the road, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that you hear about. And so I want to know, did you know what was said from the text and do you have a clear next step? To me, that's my job. The rest I leave up to the Lord. Huh. Good. Nick, I'm curious. Uh, my area uh, in the seminary here is leadership. Uh, what are some of your favorite resources when it comes to leadership development? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I, I've i probably shifted um, a little bit. I mean, I've read a ton on leadership. I love Patrick Lencioni. I love all of his stuff. Um, I love his uh, At the Table podcast. I think it's one of the best podcasts out there on leadership. Um, you know, so I'll listen to that. I think it's short and it, it gives me something to chew on. Um, I've read Maxwell's stuff, you know, I've read, uh, you know, Ryan Leake's leveling up. Those are all great. And I think they speak to you at different times. I think, uh, is it Posner's, you know, leadership books, uh, were really good and influential to me years ago, but I think I'm shifting away from, uh, needing a book to in the moment on the job leadership development. Um, where I think I grew the most in ministry was when my youth pastor handed me a group of middle school boys and said, lead a Bible study. And I had no idea what to do. And he coached me on how to do it. When I invite someone who I think is qualified to be a leader and I equip them with a specific job and a responsibility for an outcome, and then I release them to do it. And then I stay with them and coach them on the issues they have, whether it's conflict management or people or casting a vision or, you know, whatever it might be, building a team. To me, that is the essence of leadership development. That's probably a journey our, we've been on as a church of that is a shared definition of a leader that Grace Church has. Someone who invites, equips, and releases others to do the work of the ministry. When as soon as we got a shared definition, we could go places together with that. And so all of the resources that are out there, we can use to help coach people in real time on the job training. Oh, that's really good. And I, I, I'm sure talking earlier about humility too, one of the things that you want to make sure is that as you're inviting people, as you're equipping people, as you're releasing them, that they model servant leadership. And so I'd be just curious to you, like, how do you model that in your context? How are some of your other leaders modeling that and seeing that infused into the leadership culture there at Worcester Grace? Yeah, it's it's definitely a part of our our DNA for sure that we, some of it's, you know, actual, some of it's aspirational. Mm -hmm. um, I'm drawn to Psalm 78, uh, verse 72, where David, it said of him, and David shepherded them with integrity of heart. So that's the character piece, right? Um and with skillful hands, he led them. And to me, that's that's like the vision for the right kind of invitation going out to a leader, somebody that has integrity, someone that is demonstrating humility by a willingness to sacrifice and to give others preference, uh, somebody that doesn't always have to have the power and the spotlight to lead, someone that can, you know, clean up. Uh, a couple years ago, we published business cards for everybody in our team just to put at their cubicle and their desk and their office that said, you know, my name is Nick Cleveland. My title at Grace Church is whatever it takes. <laughs> you know, that's my title. Uh, and if, if serving, you know, I think it's Jeff Bogue that I first heard say this, I'm sure he stole it from somebody. Um, not because I think anything bad of Jeff, let me clarify. Uh, but he said, you know, if serving is below you or if serving is, you know, below you, then leadership is above you. And I think that's what we want to, I want to try to model. Um, and the way I can do that is when I show up at the office for our team, uh, I can go into my office and just sit down and start pounding away. What I really like to do is set all my stuff down and I walk around the office and I ask everybody how they're really doing, hmm. how their family's doing. Uh, my job is to pastor the pastors here and, uh, I, I want to care about where they're coming from and what they went through last night and how their kid did at the game and whatnot. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of our teammates or kid was in the hospital, some breathing, breathing stuff this weekend, you know, so call her and reach out and say, Hey, you know, how's it really going? And, uh, to me that all matters. And hopefully that models it a little bit on Sunday mornings. Um, I only teach like 35 times a year. That's kind of a target for me. 
And so some Sundays I'm not preaching, but I'm here. And some of the ways that I want to demonstrate that is to, I sit with my family on the front row with my Bible and I learn. And I show that I'm constantly learning under the word from all of our teachers. And then in the services that I'm not in with my family, I'll walk around and I try to find the nursery workers. I find the first, I'll be, I'm known to be a guy that likes to do first impressions. Um, and even I'll even go to the Sunday I was in Medina and I'm doing first impressions in our Medina campus. And uh, I'm only up there a few times, but I'm on video frequently and I'll shake their hand when they walk by. It's amazing. I love doing this. You shake their hand, they walk by and then they take like four steps past you and they stop and they turn out, wait a minute, you're the guy on the screen. Like, you know, it's just, the strikes are different because we haven't met yet. And so, uh, I think that's, you gotta, you model it more than you preach it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I, it's, it's something that's caught probably even more than it's taught. Yeah. Thanks for that. We're, we're actually going to move into the last part of our conversation, which is kind of ties into this is, is your relationship to Jesus. It's from the overflow. He, he is the leader that we want to follow first and foremost. And so we're going to have a couple questions for you in your walk with Jesus. Starting with that, how about friendship, um, including your wife? How, how does friendship and accountability factor into your spiritual health? Well, friendship is vital, and it can be tricky as a pastor to have authentic friends, right? Um, I'm a pastor. I've been. I've had people who I thought were my friend in the church that you know end up maybe hurting you. Um, but I am blessed right now. I've had two gentlemen who. Um, our elder quality gentlemen in our church who have been a friend and an accountability person. So actually they, they know every penny that I spend and how I spend it. I give that to them. Hmm. Uh, they, I have an accountability tracker on my devices. They get that report weekly. Uh, we meet together monthly to pray and encourage one another. Uh, and that friendship from a guy's perspective and a pastor's perspective is huge. Um, my wife is my best friend. Um, she's the barometer on things and you, you, mar- you get married and you stay married long enough. You don't even really all that have to ask all that much anymore. You can just see, and she's like, no, I think you probably are doing too much here. Maybe you should consider this. And, and my wife is the most disciplined uh, person that I know in the faith. And, uh, she inspires me by how she spends time in the word and praying for people. And she's one of those people when you tell them, Hey, you pray for this, you know, you're going to get prayed for. Um, and, uh, that is a gift to me as a, as a man and as a Christ follower, but definitely as a pastor and as a dad. And so, uh, just, we, we go on dates once a week on Monday. It's my day off. Our kids are in school and we like to go, uh, hit one of the local establishments in town and do lunch together and talk about life and, you know, what we're learning and all of that just kind of, kind of cultivates your friendship with Jesus because you're inspired by other people. I love hearing guys on this podcast talk about their wives. That's always so encouraging. Every once in a while, we got to make sure we hope, man, I hope his wife's not listening to that, but usually it's okay. (laughs) Usually it's a story about how she keeps her husband in check. You know, Mm -hmm. um, you don't impress me, she says to him or whatever, you know, it's like, but that's okay. I'll tell, I'll tell a story. Um, if, if we got time, do we have time? We got seven minutes. Okay. When we opened our student center, I had a killer illustration that I stole from Francis Chan to put my son on stage and put him up there against a cross like he was Jesus. But I didn't run it by my wife. <laughs> and and uh, I'll let you imagine what happened when I told the, the, the youth that if I was God and you asked me to sacrifice my son so you didn't have to go to hell, you'd have to go to hell. Um because I'm not God, right? Yeah. So they take my son away, and he's like maybe three or four at the time. He's just like screaming for me as she's like carrying through the church. She's like, don't ever do that to me again. I was like, <laughs> yeah. So we came up with a very good process for how our, our fam- my family gets to veto anything about them from the stage. Sounds like Nick was introduced to the guest room. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you the dog house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, the veto rule is good, except I speak ad lib sometimes and then I get the dagger stares on a Sunday morning or just the <laughs> eye roll. <laughs> I will say Bud Oshefsky attends our church and his daughter told me to be careful be- and she attends our church too because one time they got so tired 
of him using them in the sermon uh, that they took his underwear and put up a flagpole. I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but you might want to have butt on your podcast. There you go. Yeah. Okay. We're taking names down. That's great. <laughs> Tell us about um, your spiritual, just a couple spiritual disciplines that are grounding for you. Like you can't do without them. Uh, I love walking and praying. Hmm. And so um, I did that this morning. I usually go on about a four or five mile walk in the morning. Um, I'm trying to average 12,000 steps a day for a year. And uh, just spending time with the Lord, I listen to the scripture uh, read to me and I meditate on it, memorize a little bit and pray. And to me, that is just the best ever. You get out there early, still a little cool, take the dog and listen to the scripture and talk with the Lord. Uh, I love I love that. So I love to do that on the beach when I can, when I'm in an area that I can. I love to see the sunrise on the beach, as you know, Tim, because everywhere we go and there's a beach, I'm the guy that's at the beach. I know. I saw you and Kip uh, walking the beach, uh, it, probably two mornings, but I saw you one morning because I actually went out to the beach. I was like, enough of this sitting in a room. I'm going out to watch the sunrise, and it was awesome. Amen. What's the last scripture you memorized? You said you've been memorizing scripture. Yeah, I was just reminding myself uh, this morning, I'm going through the book of Romans, and I was just reading Romans 1.16, although I've had it memorized for years, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Like Just reminding myself of uh, the power of the gospel in my life and in those around me. Amen. What an encouragement to us. That'll be the theme for our conference this year, the gospel and the power of the gospel. And... Um... Looking forward to that and being face to face with people from our Caris Fellowship, which is the primary audience of this podcast. So, thank you for joining us. I always have a closing question, and it's this, Nick: uh, What is something that you need to hear from Jesus at this phase in your your life, ministry, or even today? Something you need to hear from Jesus? Yeah, you know, I'm in a season right now with what we're facing as a church, uh, as far as just you know, big season, lots of growth. We're gonna go into Lord willing a building campaign, that kind of stuff. And then our family, kids are just at a busy season. It feels, it feels like a lot is left unsettled. And I think I need to remind myself what Jesus has already told me. And that's that the anchor is there. And it's the foundation of my faith in Christ that is the only thing settled mm -hmm. in life. And maybe, maybe I think things are more settled when they're going the way I think they should. And maybe I need to remind myself that he is sovereign and my salvation secure. And that's all that really matters. Yeah. Well, let me just, let me just say that as a closing word. It is finished. He said it from the cross. It is settled. Yeah. And Colossians 1, 17 says, he holds all things together. He's doing that for you, your family, your church, and that's true. Amen. Nick, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. Yeah, thanks for being on the podcast. This is Dr. Trent Lambert from the Center for Thriving Leaders at Grace Theological Seminary, along with pastor and doctor Tim Sprinkle from Leesburg Grace Church, Thanks for listening to our conversation with Nick Cleveland. The More of Us podcast recognizes that we are not alone. We lead best when we walk with others. Join us for more of these talks by subscribing today. God bless you. Jesus holds all things together. Mm -hmm.